Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering InterConnect 2017. Brought to you by IBM. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Las Vegas at the Mandalay Bay, the Cube's exclusive three-day coverage of IBM InterConnect 2017. I'm John Furrier, my co-host, Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Harley Davis, who's the VP of Decision Management at IBM. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much. Thanks Happy for spending the here. time today. You've got a hot topic, you've got a hot area. Um, making decisions in real time with data, being cognitive, enterprise strong, and data first is really, really hard. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so, welcome to theCUBE. Um, what's your thoughts? Because you know, we were talking before we came on about you know, how data, we all love, we all data geeks, but the value of the data is all contextual. Absolutely. Give us your, your color on the data landscape and really the, the important areas that we should shine the light on that customers are, are actively working yeah. to extract those insights. So, you know, traditionally, Decisions have really been transactional, all about taking decisions on systems of record, but what's happening now is, you know, we have the availability of all this data, streaming it in real time, coming from systems of record, data about the past, data about the present, and then data about the future as well. So when you take into account predictive analytics models, machine learning, what you get is kind of data from the future, if I can, if I can put it that way. Yeah. And what's interesting is how you put it all together, look for situations of risk, opportunity, is there a fraud that's happening now? Is there going to be you know, a lack of resources at a hospital when a patient checks in? And how do we put all that context together, look into the future, and apply kind of business policies to know what to do about it in real time? And that's really the differentiating use cases that people are excited about now, and like you say, it's a real challenge to put that together, but it's happening. It's happening, and that's, I think that's the key thing, and there's a couple um, uh, mega trends going on right now that's really propelling this. One is machine yeah. learning. Absolutely. Two is the big data ecosystem, as we call it, the big data ecosystem, has always been, okay, Hadoop was a first wave, and you saw Spark, and then you're seeing that evolving now to a whole nother level, moving um, data at rest and data in motion is the big conversation, how to do that together, not yep. just I'm a batch only, or a real time only, the integration of those two. Then you combine that with the power of cloud and how fast cloud computing with compute power is accelerating. Those two forces with machine learning and IoT it, it, is just amazing. It's, it, it's all coming together. And what's interesting is you know, how, you bridge, how you bridge the gap, how you bring it all together, how you create a single system that manages in real time all this information coming in, how you store it, how you look at you know, history of events, uh, systems of record, and then apply, apply situation detection to it to generate events in real time. So you know, one of the things that we've been working on in the decision management lab is a system called Decision Server Insights, which is a big real-time platform. You send a stream of events in, it gets information from systems of records, you insert analytics, predictive analytics, machine learning models into it, and then you write a series of like situation detection rules that look at all that information and can say, right now, this is what's happening, I link it in with what's likely to happen in the future. For example, I can say, my predictive analytics model says based on this data executed right now, this customer, this transaction is likely to 90% likely to be a fraud. And then I can take all the customer information, I can apply my rule, and I can apply my business policy to say, well, what do I do about that? Do I let it go through yeah. anyway? Because it's okay. Do I reject it? Do I send it to a human analyst? We got to put all that together. So that use case that you just described, is some, that's yeah. happening today. That that's is sort of state today. of the art today. Now, so one of the challenges today, and we all know fraud's gotten, fraud detection has gotten much, much better in the last several Absolutely. years. Absolutely. Used to take, if you ever found it, it would take six months, right? And yeah. it's too late. But a lot of, still a lot of false positives that will negate a transaction. Now that's a business rule decision, right? But are we at the point where even that's going to get better and better and better? Well, absolutely. Um, I mean, the whole, the whole, there have been two main ways to do fraud detection in the past. The first one is kind of long scale predictive analytics that you train every few months and requires you know, lots and lots of history of data, but you don't get new use cases that come up in real time. Like you don't have the Ukrainian hacker who decides you know, if, I, if I do a payment from this one website then I can, uh, I can grab a bunch of money right now. And then you, you have the other alternative, which is having a bunch of human analysts who look for cases like that guy yeah. and put it in as business rules. And what's interesting is to combine the two, to retrain the models in real time and still apply the, the, the knowledge that the human analyst can get in real time. And that's happening 
every day in lots of companies now. And that idea of combining transactional data and analytics um, you know, has become popularized, popularized over the last couple of years. One obvious use case there is ad tech, right? Making offers to people, mm -hmm. uh, marketing. What's the state of, sort of that use case? Well, let's look at it from the positive perspective. Um, what we are able to do now is take, take information about consumers from multiple sources. You can look at you know, the interaction that you've had with them, let's say you're a financial services company, you get all sorts of information about a company, about a customer, sorry, from, their CR, from the CRM system, from the series of interactions you've had with them, from what they've looked at on your website, but you can also get you know, additional information about them. If you know them by their Twitter handle or other social media feeds, you can take information from the Twitter, the Twitter feeds, for example, do apply some cognitive technology to extract information from that, do sentiment analysis, do natural language processing to get some sense of meaning about the tweets, and then you can combine that in real time in a system like the one I talked about to say, ah, this is the moment right here where this guy's interested in a, in a new car. He, he's been, uh, he just got a, a we think he just got a, a promotion or a raise because he's now putting more money into, into the bank, and we see tweets saying, oh, I love that new Porsche 911. I uh, can't wait to go look at it in the showroom. If we can put those things together in real time, why not send him a proactive uh, offer for, for a loan in the new car or put him in touch with the dealer? No, and sometimes as a consumer, I, I want that. You know, when I'm looking for, say, scarce tickets to a show or a, or, a, or a playoff game or something, and I want the best offer, and I'm going to, five or six different websites, somebody were to make me an offer, hey, here are better seats for a lower price, I would be thrilled. So uh, ge geographic information is interesting too from that. So let's say, for example, that you're, you're traveling to, uh, to Napa Valley, and let's say that we can detect that you just uh, you know, took out some money from, uh, from a bank, uh, from your ATM in, in Napa, now we know you're in Napa, now we know that you're a good customer of the bank, and we have a deal with a tour operator, a wine tour operator, so let's spontaneously propose a, a wine tour to you, give you a discount on that to keep you a, a good customer. Yeah, so relevant offers like that, as a consumer, I'd be very interested in all too often, at least lately, I feel like we're in the first and second innings right. of, of that type of you know, uh, system, where many of the offers that you get are just, wow, okay, for, for three weeks after I buy the dishwasher, I'm getting dishwasher ads. But it's getting better, you can sort of see it and, and you, feel you it. You can see it getting a little better. Um, I think this is where the combination with the combination of all these technologies with machine learning and predictive analytics really comes to the fore and where you know, the new tools that we have available to data scientists, things like you know, the data science, ex your data scientist experience that IBM offers and other tools, can help you produce a lot more segmented and targeted analytics models that can be combined with all the other information so that when you see that ad you say, oh, the bank really understands me. Arlie, one of the things that people are, are work, working on right now, and most customers, your customers and, and potential customers that we talk to, um, is I got the insights coming and I'm working on that, we're going pedaling as fast as we can, but I need actionable insight. This is the decision making thing. So decisions are now what people want to do. So you, that's what you do. So, so there's some, some stats out there that um, decision making can be less than 30 minutes based on good data, the life of the data, as short as six seconds. This speaks to the data in motion, humans outside of it. I might be on my mobile phone, I might be looking at some industrial equipment, whatever, I could be a decision maker in the data center. This is a core problem. What, what are you guys doing in this area? Because this is really a core problem. Well this is, all about, opportunity. This is all about leveraging you know, event driven architectures um, Kafka, Spark, and all the tools that work with it so that we can grab the data in real time as it comes in. Um, we can associate it with the, the rest of the context that's relevant for making a decision. So basically, with, you know, action, when we talk about actionable insights, what are we talking about? We're talking about taking data in real time, structured, unstructured data, having a, a framework for, for managing it, Kafka, Spark, something like decision server insights in, in ODM, whatever. Um, applying cognitive technology to turn some of the unstructured data into structured data, applying machine learning, predictive analytics, tools like SPSS to create a kind of prediction of what happens in the future, and then applying business rules, something like operational decision management, ODM, in order to apply business policies to the insights we've garnered from the rest yeah. of the cycle so that we can do something about it. That's decision management, that's so how decision advance. So you were dollars. saying earlier on the use case um, about yeah. I get some event data, I bring it into systems of record, I apply some rules to it, 
I mean, that doesn't sound very hard. I mean, it's almost it's, as if that's happening now. It's hard. You know, it's hard, it's, I want to get, this is my whole point. Yeah. This is not possible years ago. So that's one point. I want to get some color from you on that because this was ungettable. Most of the systems, even go back 10, five years ago, was siloed. So now, rule-based stuff seems trivial, tactically, okay, I'm going to apply some rules. But it's now possible to put this package together. Now, yeah. I know it's hard, but conceptually, those are three concepts that someone will say, oh, why weren't we doing this before? It's been possible for a long time, and we have, you know, we have plenty of customers who combine, um, you know, who do you, something as simple as, you know, when you get approved for a loan, that's based on a score, which is essentially a predictive analytics model combined with um, business rules that say approve, not approve, ask for more documentation, so that's been done for years. I think, yeah. so it's been possible. What's, you know, even more enabled now is doing it in real time taking into account a much greater degree of information. Having More data sources. Data sources, things like social media, things like you know, yeah. sensors from IoT, yeah. um, you know, connected car applications, all sorts of, uh, of things like that. And, um, so more, and then done before. And then, and then retraining the models more frequently. So getting, getting better information about the future faster and faster. Give an example of uh, some use cases that you're working with customers on because I think that's fascinating. And I think I would agree with you that it's been possible before, but the concepts are known. But now it's accelerated to a whole other level. Yeah. Talk about some of the use cases end to end that you guys um, have done with customers. Let's think about something like um, an airline um, uh, that wants to manage uh, its operations and wants to help its passengers manage operational disruptions or changes. Um, so, you know, what we want to do now is take a series of events coming from all sorts of, of sources, and that can be you know, basic operational data like you know, the airplanes, what's the airplane, is it running late, is it not running late, is the connection running late, combining it with, with things about the weather, so information that we get about you know, upcoming weather events from weather analytics models, and then turning that into you know, predicting what's going to happen to this passenger for his journey in the future so that we can proactively notify him that you know, he should either, we can either rebook him automatically on a flight, we can provide him, if we know he's going to be delayed, we can automatically provide him amenities, notify the staff at the airport where he's going to be blocked because he's our platinum customer. We want to give him lounge access, we want to give him uh, his favorite drink. So combine all this information together and we're, we're, that's, that's a real use case. That's, that's, that's live, <laughs> that's live. Uh, so that I want to fly that airline. <laughs> so, I, 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 okay. So we, we've been talking okay, a lot about- American Airlines? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to put you on the spot there, hold on. <laughs> and I'll get you in well, trouble. I just ran into it's experience real, the other day where- It's a case. <laughs> the airport said, oh hey, you're not going to make your connection. I'm like, yeah, thanks for letting me know. Okay, <laughs> so, yeah. okay, we've been talking a lot about the sort of way things used to be, the way things are, and the way things are, are going to be, or actually are today, in that last example. And you talked about event-driven workloads. One of the things we've been talking about at SiliconANGLE and Wikibon and theCUBE is, is workloads. We had Batch, Interactive, Hadoop brought back Batch. Yeah. And now we have what you call this event-driven workloads. We call it kind of continuous yep. data, workloads. It's all about data right. in motion. There's, you know, we all call it different things, but it's the same right. thing. And, and, and when we look at our forecast, we're like, wow, this is really going to hit, it hasn't yet, but it's going to hit the steep part of the S-curve. What do you guys expect in terms of adoption of those types of workloads? Is it going to be so I niche? Think, is it going to be predominant? I think it, it should be predominant, and I think co companies want it to be predominant. What's, what we still need, I think, is a further iteration on, on the, the technology and the ability to bring all these different things together. We have the technologies for the different components. We have machine learning technology, predictive analytics technology, business rules technology, uh, event-driven architecture technology, but putting it all together in a, in a single framework, right now it's still a real, it's, it's both a technology implementation challenge and it's an organizational challenge because you have to have data scientists, work with IT architects, work with operational people, work with business policy people, and just organizationally bring That's everything together. That's an organizational gap. Yeah. But That's I what think, you're talking about. Yeah, but every company wants it to happen because they all see a competitive advantage in doing it this way. And what's the, uh, some of the things that are barriers being removed as you see them because that is a consistent thing we're hearing. The products so the, are getting better, but the, the organizational the easy, culture. The easy thing is the technology barriers. Yeah. That's the thing, you know, that's kind of the, the easy thing to work on. How do we have single frameworks that bring together everything that lets you develop both a machine learning model, a business rules model, an optimization, resource optimization model in a single, yeah. in a single yeah. platform and manage it all together? 
that's we're working on that, and that's going to be. Right, so I'll throw a wrinkle into the into the conversation. Hopefully, a spark, um, pun intended. Um, open source and uh, microservices and cloud native apps are coming that are with open source that's actually coming in and fueling a lot more activity. Mm -hmm. This is, should be a helpful thing to your point about more data sources. How do you guys talk about that? Because that's something you have to be part of enabling the inbound migration of new stuff. Um, is that? Yeah, we have, I mean, it's, it's, everything's part of the, uh, the environment. I mean, it's been, I think it's been the case for a while that you know, open source has been kind of the driver of a lot of innovation and we assimilate that. We can either assimilate it directly, help our customers use it you know, via services, package it up and rebrand re um, you know, open source technologies as services that, that we manage and we control and integrate it for, on behalf All right, of Harley, our customers. Harley, last question for you. Future yeah. prediction. Fresh five years out, what, what's going to happen in your mind's eye? I mean, it's not, I'm not, we're not going to hold you, I mean IBM to this, you personally. Thank you. You know, <laughs> just, just as you can see some of the stuff unfolding, because machine learning, we're expecting that to crank things up pretty quickly. Uh, we're seeing cognitive and cognitive to the core really rocking and rolling here. So what's your, how do you see the five, next five years playing out for so decision making? First thing is, I don't see Skynet ever happening. <laughs> I think we're, we're Mark so- Mark Benioff had a nice <laughs> reference in the keynote about Terminator. I'm like, no one picked up on that on Twitter. I, maybe I'm- <laughs> Yeah, so that, I, think that's, I think that's nearly, nearly impossible as a, as a scenario. But of course what is going to happen and what we're seeing accelerating on a daily basis is applying machine learning, cognitive technology to more and more aspects of our daily life. But I, I see it, it's in a passive way. So when you do image recognition, that's passive. You have to tell the computer, tell me what's in this image. But you, the human, or the developer, or the programmer, still has to kick that off and has to say, okay, now that you've told me there's a cat in an image, what do I do about that? And that's something a human still has to do. And that's, you know, that's, that's the thing that would be scary if our, if our system started saying, oh, I, you know, we're going to do something on behalf of you because we understand humans completely yeah, yeah, and what yeah. they need, so we're going to do it on your behalf, but that's, that's not going to happen. So the role of the human is critical, paramount in all this. And it's not going to go away. I mean, we decide what our business policies are and... But isn't, well, autonomous vehicles is an example of that, but it's not a business policy. It's, <laughs> It's the car making a decision for us because we can't react fast enough, presumably. But the car is not going to tell you where you want to go. Oh, absolutely. You're not going to, I mean, yeah. if, it, if it started, you know, if you got in the car and it said, I'm taking you to the doctor because you have a fever, maybe that will happen. Yeah, maybe. maybe That's kind of <laughs> Skynet-like. Um, I'd be worried about that. It might rec make a recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> a notification. Hey, you want to go to the doctor. <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm good. <laughs> but I, I really don't see Skynet happening, but I do think yeah. we're going to get you know, more and more intelligent observations from our yeah. systems, and that's, that's really cool. That's very cool. Carly, thanks so much for coming Great. on theCUBE and sharing the insights. Really appreciate it. theCUBE getting the insights here at IBM Interconnect 2017. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Stay with us. Some more great interviews on day three here in Las Vegas, more after this short break.